Good afternoon. Any questions? Questions? No questions? All right, then I'll get going because we have a lot of ground to cover today. So, first of all, processing lists in Prolog. Uh, we've now seen lists in Scala and in Racket, and in Prolog they work exactly the same way, except the notation is, of course, again, gratuitously different. So lists are delimited with brackets in Prolog. The empty list looks like you think it does. Uh, the cons operator is written like this, with a hedge, a vertical bar, and the tail. Um, but it's the exact same cons operator that you've seen before with the word cons or uh, with the colon colon. Now, uh, instead of writing John cons Mary cons Pat cons the empty list, you can just write it in the traditional form separated by commas. Um, you will use the cons whenever you actually want to construct a list or deconstruct a list. And you use the commas when you have a literal list that you want to write down. <coughs> so let's look at a very simple predicate. Remember, in Prolog, everything is a predicate. Everything is true or false. And I'm going to show you how to implement with nothing more than what you've just seen, the member predicate. So member x, comma, a list is true if x is a member or an element of the list. So to define that, I made two simple rules. I say, it is true that x is a member of a list that starts with x. And surely no one will disagree with the truth of that statement. I say, it is furthermore true that x is a member of a list with tail t if x is a member of t. Now, both of those rules are so incredibly self-evident that no one will dispute them. And they also turn out to be enough for Prolog to reason about membership. So when I now ask Prolog, is it true that Mary is a, list, is an, is a member of the list, John, Mary, and Pam? Prolog will say that's true. Well, it'll also then later say it's false, but that that's means it hasn't found any more evidence for it. It has found evidence, and that's all. Yes? Sorry, could you go back to the previous query when you talked about what each, each one meant? So for member x, uh, where x is in the bracket with the or symbol? Yes, so, so notice that this x and this x are the same x, mm -hmm. right? They, they, they have to match exactly. So we're saying, X is a member of the list whose head is X. Okay. X is a member of the list whose tail is T, provided that X is a member of it. So X is a member of this list that has tail T, if it is in fact the case that X is a member of the tail. You can't argue with that, right? So and this is the case here, that Mary is a member of John Mary Pat because it's a member of the list Mary Pat. And that's, of course, what Prolog does when evaluating this expression. Um, it's, uh, we asked, is Mary a member of this list? The first rule says, well, if it starts with Mary, which it doesn't, but Prolog has another rule to use. It uses the second rule and then says, well, let me see if Mary is a member of Mary Pat. Then, when evaluating that, this one here will grip. It'll say true. And then it's not going to be quite done because there's more work that it could do. It'll check whether it's a member of the tail. And so by doing the semicolon, it keeps on going. So it's just going to keep taking the tail until the member you're looking for is the head? Yes, or until it has no more tail to match. Okay. Okay? So you can think of this, the second rule as being a recursive rule that makes it look at uh, more and more tails, and this, the other one is the one that ends the recursion. If it finds it in the head, it's done. All right. 
Um, now let's look at another predicate um, for a pen. Now you might say, why a predicate? A pen being two lists is a new list. But you can never in Prolog write a function that yields something other than true and false. So the way that we need to formulate it is as a predicate. So append x, y, and z means that it is true that appending x and y yields z. It's easy enough to define this predicate. Um, <coughs> there are two rules about it. And we say, it is true that appending the empty list and the list that I call y's gives me back the same list, y's. Can't argue with that, right? An empty list plus a list is that same list. Now, the second rule here says, <coughs> It is true that depending a list that starts with x and ends with x's, and a list that I call y's, yields a list that also starts with x and has a tail z's, provided that append x, y's, and z's is true. That's probably easier to understand if you make a little picture that I still have here from the previous class, where I'm drawing the list with the x and the x's. After that, I'm drawing the list with the y's. And now we're also drawing what it means to be the x and the z's. And now you can see that the x and the z's is the appending of the x and the x's and the y's, if in fact x's and y's give me the z's. Yes? What, what is the purpose of the uh the worst in this case. What, what does it do in prologue? The, you mean the vertical bar? Vertical bar, yeah. It means columns. columns okay. It is the list that starts with x and has x's as the tail. It means x colon colon x's in Scala or columns x and x's in, uh, in racket. That's just the, the notation that they use. So whenever you see bracket x vertical bar y, you need to realize this thing is an element and the thing to the right of the vertical bar is the tail. It's a whole list. Exactly like quants. So these are the two rules that are clearly true for a pen, but remarkably enough, they also suffice to program what a pen means. With these two rules, Prolog is able to answer questions, such as when I append John, Mary, and Pat, what is the appendage of those? And Prolog will say the result is John, Mary, Pat. Conversely, I can say what possible lists X and Y will yield the list John, Mary, and Pat? And Prolog will enumerate them all. So Prolog can tell you that X and Y are these four possibilities, and there are no others. And it knows that from nothing more than these two rules. So we've thought of two really self-evident rules about how ending works. And that is enough to tell Prolog to actually compute the answers. And that is actually kind of amazing if you think about it. Yeah? Okay, so if you use a pen, it will just brute force through every single possibility. Okay, we will learn on Wednesday exactly how a pen does its magic. Um, and it does not use brute force. It tries to, to do matching. Um, it's a little easier to see for member. So let me go back to member one more time to, uh, to see how this matching works. <coughs> Let's say we're asking member to do this query where it's member x John Mary Pat. And now the question is how could it possibly find all the answers, right? And so what it then does is it tries to match this member thing against the first and the second head. The head is the one that comes before the period or before the colon minus. Okay, now let's see the first one here. So it's now going to match this against that. Now this x down here is a different x than the one up here. 
um, and it's, but it's going to succeed in what's called unifying the two by saying the x down here is John, right? Because the thing up here and the thing up here have to be the same. So that means this John here has to be the same as this x. And that's good enough. It now has solved the solution for x, namely that x is John, and it's going to print it out. But it's not giving up. It says, well, there's a second rule I could try. So now it's going to unify the term that you see here against the term. It says, well, those x's are apparently the same. It now says this underscore, which is another, another variable, is John. And the t is the list with Mary and Pat. So remember, x is x, and the t is Mary and Pat. Now it's going to go to the right-hand side and say, well, it looks like I need to prove this thing in order to assert the first thing. And so now it's going to say, okay, the x was x, t is Mary and Pat, and now it's going to solve this query, member of x, uh, Mary and Pat. And recursively, that's going to get it to this thing here, which is now trying to match against Mary and Pat, and then this will force the x to be Mary. So that's all Prolog ever does is it takes two expressions and matches them piece by piece. And then depending on where it is, it either just defines more variables and keeps on going to right-hand sides, or if it sees a period, it's going to pronounce a solution and maybe go back up to say, oh, I found the solution which was a part of a bigger thing. So Prolog can do nothing but match. It has no intelligence whatsoever. All it does is match these rules. In fact, um, if I had an extra homework for you, I would make you implement the matching rule in, in Scholar or something, because it is kind of amazing how you can write it in like 30 lines of Scholar. So. The whole heart of problem. Okay, so in a pen, we can do the same thing, and we will do this in some detail on Wednesday. Um, like I said, I, I used to teach the exact prolog algorithm first and then have people do a bunch of programming with it, but only to realize that it doesn't, it's just not super helpful when you write actual programs. Um, I'll come back in a minute to what is helpful. So in the homework assignment, which I really urge you to start like right now, I'm asking you to do a whole bunch of these list predicate things um, where you know, last E of L says, is E the last element of L? Yes or no? Not last S of L. Is S the list of everything but the last element in L? The subsequences. Is, is S a subsequence of, uh, of L, meaning of adjacent elements? And then if you ask what are the subsequences of a list, then it'll give you all of them. Or is it a sublist where maybe you skip some elements, like here the one, three, is a sublist, but not a subsequence of one, two, three, skipping the two. So you don't see the one, three down here with the subsequence. Um, so there's a couple more of these. Each one of those is two lines of prolog. Two lines, two lines, two lines, two lines, two lines. And for split to my great shame, I was not able to do it in two lines. I had to use three. So go ahead and do those. Oh, permutation, by the way, I'm going to have to correct because there is a built-in permutation. I'm going to rename it perm, and I want you to write it by hand in all of two lines. Now, without is, is your friend. Without is, is amazingly useful because it, uh, so what without does is you give it a list and then some element, which usually will be some variable, and then it gives you the list that's done by removing that element. And that's an easy way of, of doing recursion. You use the element for something, and then you have the rest ready for the recursive call. Yes? I have a question about the um, It says at the end that you're going to be running a, a dot .prolog file, although the endings for the files that I'm seeing in my assignments in my project are .pl. Um, problem? Yes. You're going to have to name the dot prolog. How do you make them? Well, that's when I set up the uh, sweet uh, prolog. It, it can default it to be how it's set up. How do you write them? In, pro in, in prolog, yeah. I just write them in, a, in, in Emacs. Oh. I mean, I just write them in a text editor. I didn't even know that this Swipple thing has a text editor. SWI prolog is for Windows. Yeah, that's the link that I followed through the, the lab. And that's what I'm 
Okay, well, if your uh, if yours can run, has an editor, or whatever. Um, I've never because the only thing that I, I know about is the thing that you run on the terminal. I mean the file the file type. It's called PC Emacs. PC E Emacs. Okay, I, I, I have not used the editor and I don't think I have any intention of using it. Is it any good? Uh, I, I was just worried if the, the, file, the file type, the dot, dot prolog or dot. It had, so so the, the, the grader is going to use this file name and you need to call it like that. Yeah. Um, I think the reason that I did dot prolog is to, to, some people use dot p alpha perl. You know, not that any sentient being should touch a profile, but uh, and so to me it doesn't matter what uh, what the file associations are or anything. So yes, so so please uh, prolog so that the programmer doesn't have to go crazy. Um, yes, I'll um, I'll run you through some example code in a, in a few minutes that you again see that how I use the environment. I mean, you're free to use you know whatever. If uh, and I'll give that editor a try to see if, if it does, in fact, do anything useful. I mean, given how crusty the debugger was, I uh, have never ventured out to find it out. All right, um, on to numbers. So you can work with numbers and throw up, and you'll see that um, sometimes you have to use, use numbers, um, but it's actually a little bit inconvenient. Um, that's first of all, a few of the operators look weird. So you have greater, greater or equal, less than, and then equal or less than, which must be a French thing. Um, equal, colon, equal, that means equality of numbers, and equal smash equal means inequality of numbers. And you have to be careful with equals. There is another equal operator in Prolog, the normal equal, and that means unification, which means that you're matching the left and the right hand side. And so in Prolog, if you ask x equals 3 plus 4, then Prolog will not solve this in any way. Uh, it will try to match x against the expression 3 plus 4. You can equally well say 3 plus 4 is x, by the way, because the matching or unification operator is commutative. And when you ask that, then Prolog will answer to you saying, well, I have a solution for this, namely x equals 3 plus 4, you know, which is not super helpful. Yes? This sounds this is totally off topic, but it's relevant, uh, relevant to um, Prolog. What does the question mark dash mean? Oh, it means provides, it means provided that. Let's go back to this. I thought it was colon dash. Oh, where's the question mark dash? Question mark dash. Yeah. yeah. So when you're in the... Uh, I can't find any information. Where is the question mark dash? It's right in the middle of the query. In the sweep, in the, uh, in the prolog query uh, line, you, there's a question mark dash before you type in any command line. Oh, is that just the prompt? I think so, yeah. That's just oh my god, okay, yeah, it's just the prompt. Yeah. Okay. yeah. okay. It's never risen to my level of consciousness, so... Uh, <laughs> All right, so back to this. So, so by default, an arithmetic expression is unevaluated and is only used for matching. Just like everything else in Prolog is unevaluated and is only used for matching. So if you say over here, like a pen, that you have some expression there, it's never that Prolog ever figures out what the, what the expression means. It just matches bits and pieces until it finally can say yes or no, or true or false. So, but on the other hand, with arithmetic operations, you often do need to force evaluation. And the way to do that is the, with the is operator. So when you say x is 3 plus 4, then the right-hand side of the is is computed as an integer expression, and its result is then unified with x. So in this case, if you say x is 3 and 4, then the answer is x matches 7. So you can have variables on the right-hand side, but they must already be bound to, num to numbers so that is can do its thing. Now, Prolog cannot solve any equations. So if you ask it to solve 7 equals 3 plus x, then Prolog will instantly say false. After all, 
the equal sign matches terms. On the left-hand side of the equal here, you have the term seven. On the right-hand side, you have a term that starts with plus. They can never match. And that's what product count. Now, that means that you have to go through a modest amount of hoops whenever you want to do any kind of arithmetic. Let's look at the factorial example here. Again, it has to be a predicate. We, have to, we can't have factorial return the answer. Instead, we have to make it so that factorial has two arguments and factorial of n comma f checks whether n factorial equals f. So let's write the, uh, the predicate. I say factorial of 0 is 1. It is true that factorial of 0 is 1. It is true that the factorial of n is f, provided that n is greater than 0. And 1 is n minus 1. That's how I force the evaluation. So I want to compute n minus 1. And the only way to compute n minus 1 is to compute it and stuff it in another variable. The factorial of n1 is f1. And then f is, again, note the is, n times f1. In that case, f is n times n minus 1 factorial. And it really is the same recursive solution that you've seen in any number of other languages, except that each time that I had an arithmetic step, I had to use is to force its computation. So now when you want to compute a factorial, um, let's say you want to compute one factorial, that's not to be ambitious here, then um, the, the one doesn't doesn't match the zero, so it goes on to the second line, says, okay, one is greater than zero. Now it says n1 is now zero, because one minus one is evaluated to zero, and then you get n to the next case. <coughs> so if you don't use this, arithmetic expressions work like all other expressions. They are un unevaluated. They are simply represented by the expression tree. So internally, n plus 1 is an add of n comma 1. And you could use it to match another add, but that's all you can, you can use. So let's uh, try this with another uh, example. I want to implement the numlist predicate, where numlist, where a and b are numbers, will give me the list of all of the numbers between A and B. And uh, this is actually a, uh, a primitive in SWI prologue, but let's assume that we want to actually define it. Here's the definition. I say that the num list from ranging from A to B is empty if A is greater than B. And the num list from A and B otherwise, if A is less equal than B, notice the funny inversion in the less equal, I, I know it starts with an A, that's the same A, they match, and then it has a tail that I call X's. And so that's true provided that, that the tail is the numberless that starts from A plus 1. Um, that doesn't quite work, unfortunately, because of the A plus 1. So if I were to ask with this implementation what is the numberless from 1 to 10, then I would get the list 1, 1 plus 1, 1 plus 1, 1 plus 1 plus 1, until the plus 10 times. Now, which is not really what I want. Uh, what I want is I want to evaluate each of these, sum ends, of these sums here. And the way to do that is to force the computation at the spot where previously I had the a plus 1. And stick that a plus 1 into a variable here and then use the variable inside here. Okay? <clears throat> now we've already seen that with many prolog predicates, I can put the query x or the query variable into any number of slots. So I can say, for example, with append, I can say, give me all the x and y 
that appended together give me this one. I can also do it the other way around. I can say, you know, given two lists, what do they append to? I could even ask to give me all solutions to append x, y, z. But when you try that, it's unsatisfactory because it's going to, to, to generate some variables that it doesn't know what they are. And it's going to actually tell you if you have like some variable and another variable, and then it's going to give you a list with the two of them in there. Um, but you know, of course, that's not really what, what you want. Now, yes? So is that arrow greater than or equal to, or is that like, uh, resulting of? Oh, no, this is just something that, that I, this is not a problem. Simple okay, sorry. but in for a lot, it, like, is, the is there a fat arrow? I don't know. No, like, because you said the less, the less than or equal is equal sign less than. So is the greater than equal, equal sign greater than? And here are the operators. So greater or equal oh, okay. looks like this. And equal greater looks the other way around. I don't know whether that was a potentially misguided form of symmetry or... Okay. Uh, it's, that's just the way it is. Okay. Yes, and then the error, the error here, uh, that was just my creation of saying this... Mm. The result of this is, no, I, I should take that out because it is confusing. So factorial 3x gives you the answer that x is 6. Well, can we ask the opposite question? Can we ask it which number has the factorial 6? And so Polar will say fake. It'll just not, it'll say there is no answer. And in a way, there is no way that it could know, right? Because what does it know about factorial? The facts that it knows about factorial are down here. And there's no way of pattern matching this stuff that would somehow get you the fact that 3 factorial is 6. Now, if I asked you which factorial is 6, I mean, how would you figure it out? look up the inverse function of the gamma function. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, other than using the inverse of the gamma function, right? So, I mean, if I asked... <coughs> so normally people would say, well, yeah, let's just try it. One factorial is too little, two factorial is too little, four factorial is too big, three factorial, that matches exactly, right? And so, uh, it is... <coughs> it's possible to answer some of these things with a strategy called generate and test, where you first generate a whole bunch of candidates that if there is a solution, uh, the candidate list contains them, and then you test. That's something that one does a lot in Prolo. So it's, uh, it's a very nice, fast way to find some solutions if you first have a potentially large set of, uh, of candidates, and then you filter them down to the ones that actually match. So here is how we would do it if we wanted to write a function that I call solve fact, that solves the factorial. I first generate all the candidate solutions. Now, certainly if I want to know which factorial is m, then going up to m is going to be ample, right? If I wanted to know which factorial is 100, or is there one that, that, is that I wouldn't have to try for more than 100. In fact, I could stop much lower than that, but I'm lazy and I didn't try to optimize that. So I'm now generating all the candidate lists. And then I use member. Member will pick all the elements in turn because the people keep on trying them. It'll pick all of the elements in from my candidate list L. And then it'll try to see if there is a match. And if so, it'll report the match. And if not, it'll just keep on trucking. So this it's amazing with how little code you can produce the generate and test them, right? You have to generate all of the candidates. This thing here is like your for loop that says go through all of them. And then here you have the if condition. So it is marvelously concise how you can do this. Yes? How do you make this stop on n factorial? Well, um, we're not going to cover how to make it stop um, because we're not te teaching all of, I mean, I'm not teaching you all of Prolog in this course. There is a way of, ma of making it stop. Um, so, 
And so when you go, um, as you undoubtedly will with some of the homeworks, um, when you go to Stack Overflow, they will tell you, you know, someone will tell you what to do, or other people will agonize over how to use what's called the cut operator to make it stop in the right place. Um, we're only interested in the phenomenon of pure logic programming and not in the efficiency of it. So <coughs> here's a practical application of, of, of all of this. Um, you can use Prolog to analyze what's called uh, two-person uh, games. So uh, you know, two-person games with full information and uh, no, no randomness at all. Uh, so in such a game, and you can think of chess as an example, that you have a game state or position that the game is currently in, and then you have a deterministic way of determining what are all the legal successor positions. So in chess, what is a legal position? It is the arrangement of all of the pieces on the board. There's one more piece of information that you need to know to evaluate a chess position. Like if you look at the position over here, that by itself is not good enough to tell you the complete game state. You, who's turn? you need to know whose turn it is, right? Because it's vastly different if uh, black or white now continues. So um, those two pieces of information, the array of the uh, positions plus the Boolean where the white or black comes next, that is the entire game state. I, I, I should say that's the position right. in chess. Now in chess there's a function that given any position you can enumerate all the successor positions. Let's say that we know it's white's turn, then you now know, you know that white can move one of the pawns or the uh, <coughs> or the queen or whatever. Um, so, and it's a finite number of positions. There's a rather large number of positions in chess, but certainly finite. So, <coughs> we're not going to be analyzing chess in this way, um, but with uh, simpler games where it's really easy to write the move function that says, given an x, what are all the possible positions y? But that's what makes a, a, a one of these two-person games, that you can write a function that given any state x will give you the one that comes next. Now, with these positions, there's also, some of them are what's called winning positions. So this, this is not by itself a winning position yet, because the, uh, the other player is not checkmated. But if they were, that would be a winning position. Now, so we'll, we know what a winning position is. That's when the other person can no longer make a legal move. Now, there's another way of having a winning position. Suppose you have a position where no matter what the opponent does, you'll win in the next turn. That's a winning position. I just have to technically wait one turn. Conversely, a losing position is when no matter what you do, the other guy will win in the next position. And so you can partition positions and saying some of them are winning positions, some of them are losing positions. And in Prolog, this is super easy to compute. You say a winning position is where no matter what move you make, the next one is a losing position. That rule is enough to enumerate all winning positions. So let's look at a more concrete example. So here I have the world's simplest game. So there's a pile of pebbles. So the Neanderthals played this. Um, so there's a pile of pebbles. And each player can take either one pebble or two pebbles. And you lose if you're having to take the last pebble. It's like Uno. OK, so uh, it's like Uno. I, I don't know. Uh, so. You can implement this trivially in Prolog. Here's how. We're saying <coughs> if there are two or more pebbles, let's say there's two pebbles and some more left, and I'm taking one of them. That's <coughs> legal. Right? Notice that there's one fewer here. The tail matches. So that was the take one. And I had to put at least two pebbles in here to make it so that you can't go from one pebble to another. 
Or if there's at least three pebbles and you take two, then that's also a little. And those are all the little ones. And then I have my line here that says, to win means that uh, all the moves lead to, to losing positions. So let's just walk through this by hand. Is a single pebble the winning position? And it's not because trying to match either of those two rules with a single pebble, it won't work. See, the, the, these two lists only match lists of length at least two. So none of these moves will be matched at all. So Prolog will say, well, that's false. I can't do anything. And that, that's not a winning position because winning means that you first have to be able to do the move. Prolog can't do the move. Let's see if two pebbles are a winning position. And Prolog will say yes because when I take one pebble, it's going to now match this one against the following rule, and then take one pebble. That'll make mean y is just one pebble. And then when Prolog wants to show that not win of y is true, it can do that, because win of y it can't do, so the not is true. So it says, I have found a way that when I'm faced with two pebbles to get to a position that I know to be a losing position. Same thing with three, because then it'll take two. But when you have four, then taking either one or two is not going to get you into a losing position. And so Prolog will say that is not a winning position. And five turns out to be a winning position again. And how uh, I many is it? Seven, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven is a losing position. And so this three line piece of code is enough to analyze the game. So I can really quickly demonstrate this. Um, so I put that the same rule will work for any two-player game. Yes, absolutely. So how does that work in chess? Like if you checkmate them, then they're going to check with you. Yes. Yeah, so so now in uh, in chess, you can do the exact same thing. The only thing is the move predicate would probably be more than two lines, right? Or it might be you know, 40, 50 lines of prologue to write down this move predicate. And then you can do the same thing. Let, before doing that, let me sh pretty quickly show what you do with the pebbles. Um, Are the new arguments game states within the list of remaining pebbles? Yeah, the game states, whatever you want to do for the game state. Uh, and every game has, has some easy way of representing the state, or maybe some not so easy. Like here, I've chosen the list of pebbles. And you'll see in the lab why that is actually a good way of doing it. Um, for chess, you know, I would presumably have a list of positions of the pieces or some such thing, or a two-dimensional array. So, um, I could just try to find out whether one of these things is a winning position, and it says it is. Um, says this is a winning position this is a losing position and so on we could if it's just true then false yeah oh that means it has established it's a winning position uh -huh. and then this for the, the next false means and I, I have nothing else that I can say about it so it's tried other things but it's not come up with another result why, oh, okay. why did that not happen for the six being I uh, it's just weird. <laughs> so what if we tried other things and it did return a true result? Would you say true? What's that? So you said the true semicolon false means that it's tried something, it, or it says it's a winning position, but it tried other things and those were false. No, it says and I have no, uh, nothing else to report. Oh, okay. It doesn't say that it's changed its mind or anything. Oh. So it's already determined that it's true, it is a winning position, mm -hmm. but then I didn't program it efficiently so that it stopped as soon as saw the win. Oh. I could do that, but I didn't want to get into that. Oh, okay, gotcha. And so it kept on searching for more answers. So it could happen to you that I would say true, true, false. In this case, because there's no free variables in here, it's not reporting any variables. Okay. So the false just means it stopped searching. Okay. It doesn't mean that it uh, 
really anything else. Now, okay. why in this case did it stop searching? We'd have to look at exactly how the search goes. Mm -hmm. um, we'll get to that more on Wednesday. It has little practical importance, but uh, there is there actually is a rational answer to why it does this. Okay. All right. So what? Do, oh yeah. And I wanted to demonstrate move. So if I say um, And move is actually the better place to get started when one debugs one of these things. So then I started with seven, so it says six pebbles are okay, five pebbles are okay, and then it's done. Don't ask why I didn't say false now. <laughs> so um, so you, you first program move so that it works to your satisfaction, and then you simply use this line here that says what a winning position is, and that just depends on move. And then you're done. That, that gives you any, any of these two player games with perfect information. Now what about chess? So we'll put in our 40 or 50 lines for move. Mm -hmm. And then we will ask whether the starting position mm -hmm. of chess, opening white, mm -hmm. is a win. And if we had enough memory and time, mm -hmm. Prologue would say true or false. No one knows what Prologue would actually say because it's, as today, an unknown question whether chess, when white opens, has a winning strategy or not. So because the, the search tree is just so enormous that there's not enough memory in the, in the universe to, to do just that. But, uh, well, chess actually has, uh, has rules that say that it will terminate. So I'm not entirely truthful with the game state. The, uh, there's a rule in chess that says you can't, uh, if you get to the same position more than twice. Mm -hmm. So you would, the positions actually would have to be a memory of all the previous positions mm -hmm. as well. So you can enforce that rule. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a finite game. Um, you know, with all these other ones, we've made it finite by saying you have to take at least one pebble. Mm -hmm. But chess is def definitely cannot get itself into an infinite loop. Mm -hmm. What happens if you win with chess the list of a single pebble? Let's try that. You, get false. you would definitely get false, and that one is really easy to do. In fact, I'll, let's trace it. So it tries to match the move, and it fails right away because um, it can't match either one of these moves. And so then it tries to match with with the win, and uh, that it, it came back out and it failed. Or you lose if you take out the last one? Yes, that's not worse. Whoever takes the last one loses. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how this game analysis works. Um, it works with simple games by doing a, a complete enumeration of the game tree. Of course, with a complex game like chess, uh, any chess playing program has to work very hard at pruning the, the tree of decisions to make sure that it, it can actually play. Um, and that's not something that, that this very simple algorithm can do. Of course, we could program something like that in Prolog, and, you know, and it still would be a pretty effective way of doing this kind of search. All right, that's what we have here. So let's go forth with the lab. Um, and I will talk to you in about 20 minutes or so and how it's, how it's going. So um, you know what? Step one is pretty simple, and you can do it at home. Let's go and just go right into step two where the action is with this uh, game of NIM. So NIM is exactly like the Neanderthal game, except that when the Cro-Magnon people came along, they made it a bit more sophisticated. Now, instead of taking one or two, you can take one or up to half the marbles. Oh, that's the marble game? Yeah, so the, the Neanderthals still did pebbles, but I guess the Cro-Magnon people knew how to melt glass, and so they used marbles. I have no idea if that's true. Yeah. Just Over this together. So um, I first implemented just the rule that was on the, on the lab sheet. And so with just this rule, let's know I need lab two. Um, yeah, that's, that's okay, I'm redefining this. So um, we, so we 
have five pebbles and so the rule that we right now have allows us to have up to four. Okay, why not five? Because um, two is the smaller one, the, the one after taking them off. Two, together with at least one yields from, so that rules out uh, five pebbles. Also notice that, um, and this is generally a really good thing, um, so from is the one that where I, where I put in the five pebbles. And now when you look at this rule over here, you will notice that it forces two into a finite number of choices. Because Prolog can solve for what are all possible sub, uh, x's and y's that you can append to get five, uh, a list of five. And that's a good thing because um, what you sometimes see when you try some prolog predicate that you think makes sense is it veers off in outer space and gives you just general variables like G4711 or something. And then you see that it seems to be unconstrained. But in this case, two is one of a finite set. That's all it can try out. It has to be inside from. Uh, and so that's really nice. So now what we do want to know is we, uh, we, what we want to do is we want to say it also has to be true that two is at least half as long as from. And so there was a tip here that says append it to itself and check that you can append more to get from. So we're going to append it to itself and get a list to two. And then we're going to see that from is no longer than to two, right? That uh, we can go from from by appending something and get to to two. So that means it's at least half as long. And I didn't use anything more than a pen. So let's try that. Um, and now when I uh, list the moves, notice that I don't get 0, 1, and 2 anymore because they are too short. And I get the 3 and the 4. And just to see, this was an odd number of elements. Let's see what happens for an even number. Now I get 3, 4, and 5. So it does seem to find the right number of moves. So now let's see um, whether this is a winning move. And it says yes. With, uh, with six, it's a uh, winning move. Um, with seven, it's, it's a losing position. With eight, it's a winning position. With nine, it's a winning position. Let me show you another losing position. Three is a loss. Four is a win. Does anyone know which ones are the winning positions? Evens. Um, so he, the conjecture was the evens. So it's now five is also a winning one and it's not even. So three is a losing position. Seven is a losing position. The next losing position is 15. The next losing position afterwards is 31. So if anyone invites you to a game of these of, uh, of with a bunch of marbles, and you see that there's 31 marbles on the table, and you are invited to start, you should politely decline. If, on the other hand, you are invited and there are 40 marbles and you start, what should you do? Join. You join, and then how many do you take? Nine. Nine, so that the other fellow is left with a losing position of 31. Mm -hmm. And the other fellow would do, like to do nothing more than get you to the losing position of 15, but he or she can't because... 15 is the maximum number of marbles they can take, which gets to 16. So that's that's how this particular game works, and you can see how you can analyze it with Prolog in this way. So one more minor trivia fact. So here I've done this with marbles, and the marbles were done as a little O. What if I want to make this with pebbles that I want to indicate with a little P? You can make those 
So if you look at where does the O come in here, it only comes in at this point here where I say I have to add at least one other. Well, it doesn't really matter what it is, right? So let me just say I can add in any symbol. And you want pebbles? That works with pebbles, right? Or if you want to know what what are the next moves? Then it gives you pebbles. Okay, for that matter. You can label them any one. Well, that one, interesting enough, you can't. So they apparently all have to be the same. It's because of the how append works, right? Oh, because of the append comma. Append, when I appended it to itself, yes. Then that would not match. Yes, exactly. So um, anyway, so now we have established it for all of those. So that's what you do. And so you see it's, it's perfectly simple. Um, there's one homework where you have to do something similar, except with numbers, um, and I, I don't think it'll uh, it'll be too challenging because it really is exactly the same thing. So very briefly, what did you miss with this other here? This is uh, just factorial translated into power of two, and I want to demo the one thing where something goes wrong. So over here, I'm having the the a power of two, and I'm putting an n minus one inside here, and so if I do that. Um, Let me go back to the original, where I had that. Now if I ask, is it true that uh, true of the 3 is 8, then it's going to say false. And if we trace through why that is, then <coughs> Now we're going to see it computes the power of th 3 minus 1, and then 3 minus 1 minus 1. And here's really the moment of truth. Now it asks, is it true that 3 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 is greater than 0? Well, what do you think? No. It's going to say that's false, because it has not evaluated what 3 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 is. And now it's going to fail all the others. Okay, so you need to force the evaluation, and you do that by using is, right? N1 is N minus 1, and then you put the N1 in here. And now it'll work. So now it says that's true, because it will have done the evaluation. Okay, that's all I have for the day.